Hi, it's everyone. How are you doing? All right. Good to see you. Uh, welcome to another Lives on Lockdown. And I'm going to go all the way to my very good friend in Egypt, Hashem El Gahi. How are you? I'm good, man. How are you? Thanks for uh, inviting amazing. me on. I'll tell you what, the last time I saw you, Hashem, uh, was 2014. In, in 2014, in December 2014. It yeah. was, and we were just yeah. drowning in a, in a lake of, uh, of cheese. I think. And, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I remember up in Gree, right? In the in the, in the mountains when the, oh. when they took us to the mountains when the Swiss took us to the mountains, Andrew. <laughs> we loved it. The Swiss roll. It was going to be good. And I was the chair, a glorious title, a glorious title. I was the chair of the Montreux International Comedy Festival, and you came over, and the Swiss. I came. Didn't know what hit them? <laughs> oh my God! I remember I bombed at the end of the first show because I did a very sexual joke. Because like, and I remember that it was, it was, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm taking it home. The other, uh, I don't know where she was from. She was a French comic and she was doing an English uh, performance. And she said something about the lady parts. I, I don't know how, how I, I, should I censor myself or not? I don't even know what, if I should just go full throttle. <laughs> but uh, yeah, she was saying some, you know, some stuff about her lady parts. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do my sexual joke. And I went on stage and I was do, it was going so well. Like it was the best 10 minutes they've ever done. And then boom, dropped the sexual joke. And the Swiss, just like everything in life, they were neutral about it. They didn't say anything. <laughs> it was just like, yeah, I was like, okay. okay. We love your Swiss Army wife. I think that was the one. <laughs> oh my God! Oh my! It was it was talking about being a sensitive guy, and then there's nothing more than that I love and adore than making love to a woman and ejaculating on her face. <laughs> so that was the joke. Yeah, it was pretty bad. <laughs> exactly. it was I, I tell you what, it was a great family audience. We loved it. it was, it was kind of <laughs> I remember that. I remember, I remember Mike Leibovitz. All I hear after I I said that punchline. All I hear in the background, silence in front of me, and in the background on my left, all I hear is, <laughs> and it's Mike Leibovitz, a Chicago comic, dying from the punchline. He loved it. He was like, oh my God. There, there are those sort of extraordinary moments when people just basically you bomb in front of an international was, audience. It, it's got to oh, be good. I love it. I love it, man. It's uh, it's one of my favorite things on my resume. I put it up there when I get a book. I'm like bombing an international audience. It, it, it takes some real effort, you know, Hashem. You, you've got to get out there and do it. You've got to come all you the know. way over. But I what a glorious over. setting that was. So I haven't seen you since then, but I, I've heard brilliant stuff about you ever since Thank you, your man. bag. I think you've Thank traveled you, the world so people don't catch up with you. So tell Thank me, you, tell me what you've been up to since I last saw you. Okay, uh, like you want the personal or professional? Yeah, all side. of it. I, I want the whole. All of it. So, 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 I don't know. Should I play some sad music in the background? Yeah, no. I, I, well, I can do that. <laughs> You're gonna lead up to the same punchline. This is gonna be the okay. Same. So, so fun, funny enough, in that during that performance, uh, it was the first time I was ever on stage uh, with the knowledge that because uh, I went and uh, at the time I, when I went to Switzerland. Um, my mother, may she rest in peace, she, she was in the ICU at that point. And, her, and like, I was in Switzerland on stage, so it was like it's the first time for me to be on stage and have the knowledge that my mom could go at any time. So that was pretty weird, I guess that was a, at that time. And then, because uh, she got sick at that same exact time. And then I came back from that performance, just thrilled. I'm like, mom, I made the Swiss laugh. And they're like, what? You know, <laughs> and they have really good cheese. Do you like it? You know, I don't and, know. We uh, love that cheese, didn't we? The one that I particularly okay. liked was that the raclette. Do you remember the raclette? They sort the of roasted out, and you get, you get people scraping yeah, it off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's taken about fund. four years just to reduce down from what whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, so I came back to Egypt, and my mom was sick, so I had to deal with that. And uh, just for the next year and a half, it was just like taking care of her, you know, putting comedy to the side. But with like focusing more on my personal life with my mom, and then comedy was like less, you know what I mean? And uh, one of my comedians is calling me right now. Yeah, but, they're just uh, saying how funny they're trying to remind you of that punchline you did. It's good. Oh my God, yeah. So, so then I came back and I did that. I met with some, uh, I remember I met with like a Libyan, a Libyan guy who, who had money and he's like, I like what, he attended one of my open mics. He's like, I like what you're doing. I'd like to put money. I'm like, are you Saudi? He's like, no, I am Libyan. We also got money. I'm like, what? And I'm like, all right, cool. So then he, start, he ended up uh, starting a rival company. And yeah, and 
assigned five of the comedians that I introduced him to out of all the comedians in Egypt, right? And then, uh, and then that didn't work out for him like a year later. And then I got a call in 2016 um, that uh, Comedy Central is in the region and they wanted to, uh, to work together. And I thought it was spam, right? I was like, uh, I got that email. Literally, it's like, you know those emails that you get thrown on your inbox all the time? You're like, this is fucking spam, right? Fuck that, right? Right? <laughs> so, so I see it. Li li because I, I, I can show you like the freaking email. It says, literally, there's no signature, right? So you know it's bogus, right? And it says Comedy Central underscore first contact. I'm like, fuck you. And you've won funny. $20 million of a deceased <laughs> relative who has it. Is your, is yeah. your bank account details here? Yes. But, but, but then there was a number, right? There was a Dubai number. And it's like, it was very brief. It's like, hi, um, we're very interested to work with you. And I'm like, yeah, I've seen that before. I've seen that shit. I'm not going to fall for this. And before pressing delete, I see a phone number. And I'm like, nah. I need your phone. I, I'm a struggling entrepreneur. I don't have fucking international. I can't call Dubai, right? So I'm like, no, let me get your phone, right? So, so I call and I'm like, hey, this is Hashim al garhi from Egypt. You got in touch on my website. Uh, and then I hear two words that changed my life, you know? Um, she's like, hey, we're here. And I'm like, we're here. Hmm, what does that even mean, <laughs> right? And then it just like clicked because I had seen like an ad for Comedy Central on OSN. Uh, it's a it's a network here in in the, in the Middle East, Orbit Showtime, right? And uh, I had seen it, and I just re disregarded it. And, and then at that moment, you know, when things you just have a breakthrough and it just clicks, it's just like ah! it all came together. And I was like, ah! we're here. And then I was like, can you hold on one second? And I literally put my phone on mute, and I'm like, yes, <laughs> just in celebration. And then uh, I put it off mute. I'm like, um. Yes, you were saying? <laughs> and then she's like, hey, it's my fourth day on the job. Give me time. I was like, hey, my mom's dying. I got great amount of time, you know, so it's all good, right? So then that was in two, August 2016. And then she called it, she called me on, um, like I followed up with her in like September or October, I forget. And she's like, hey, can you come to Dubai in December? I was like, of course I can come to Dubai. Hold on, let me check the schedule. Of course I can, right? And then, uh, I'm like, for a gig? And she's like, yeah, yeah, for a gig. Um, but it's for TV. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, we're recording a TV show. Do you have comedians? I was like, do I have comedians? Come on. And then, and then I made that phone call to the, to, the, to the comedians that I work with. And I'm like, guys, life-changing opportunities are about to happen right now, right? And then it was just, it was just crazy that year. Um, because um, switching back to the personal side, mom wasn't getting any better um uh she my mom was diagnosed with liver cirrhosis so she had like a failing liver right and at the time when i came back from switzerland it was that time where i had to we had to go under the you know we had to go into the procedure of like hey let's find mom a donor like all right <laughs> right so so yeah they're like where are your children they're like she's like i have three children and one of them is in the army so he can't donate right because uh, he belongs to the state, right? And the other one's in the States, and so who's left? The guy that just came back from Switzerland, right? So then I'm going and doing all these tests uh, right after, right? To see if I'm a, a, I'm a donor. And they do it in different phases. And I'm like, all right, cool. So let's, uh, let's do this. Let's, let's save mom, <laughs> right? And that was before a Comedy Central phone call, right? That was all in 2015. And then what ended up happening is that uh, I was the donor. I was going through all the phases, like just checking them off. I was like, yeah, blood type, got, got you, mom. I got this, you know. And then um, because they do it in different phases, so the next phase was uh, the, the liver, uh, what's it called? The liver, uh, I'm trying to translate it from Arabic. <laughs> um, what is my English? It's a seer. How do you no, come no, no, I love it. So the liver, the liver transfer? You know, what, what we yeah, no, no, no. So, biopsy? No, yeah. The, no, the biopsy was the last one. Before that, it was the, the x-ray. So they have okay. to give you like a dye. They, they're like, we're going to insert this dye into your veins so your liver can glow. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> right? So then I do that. And then uh, I go to the, to the doctor. I'm like, hey, here's my x-rays, you know? And then he's just fucking cold-blooded, like Dr. House style, you know what I mean? Like, just he's like, mm. like he puts up the x-rays. <laughs> On the thing he's like oh, according to these x-rays he's like yeah you're out get me a donor and i'm just like yeah and i'm like what do you mean i'm out i just fucking nailed all these tests 
He's like, yeah, you see these uh, three arteries around your liver? He's like, here's your liver. Here's your three arteries. If we do surgery here, you're fucking dead. Get me a donor. I'm like, what? Yeah, I swear. So, <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So I had to go to my mom and I was like, hey, mom, can't really help you anymore. And, you know, I'm like, so you're, you know, I'm sorry. I can't help you. You know, I'm out. I have to get a donor. And in Egypt, there's no organ donation program, right? Yeah. And uh, there is no way that unless it's through family and I was the, the option, right? So then after that, uh, fast forward that year and a half, we're looking for donors. We're in inside, in and out of hospitals, and then uh, you come back to uh, after Comedy Central, or actually before Comedy Central, before we traveled. After she's like, "Hey, do you have comics?" I'm like, "Yeah." So I tell the guys, and uh, we've dealt with a lot of producers in the past, a lot of people like that, including that Libyan guy that made promises that never really went through. So my guys were just like fed up with this shit. They're like, "Hashem, come on, fuck you, buddy!" Like you already, you know, like we're sick and tired of everybody talking shit i'm like no guys this is for real so then i went and i relayed this information to comedy central i'm like listen my guys over the years we've just been hearing a lot from different producers that just want to capitalize on us so and she's like listen i'll i'll relax your guys i'm like what, what are you gonna do she's like i'm gonna put them on a conference call with the head of comedy central middle east would that do i'm like fuck yes <laughs> yeah that's great <laughs> all right and then she called we have this conference call I remember i was at the bank paying my car loan <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then we have the call and then she tells the guys, she's like, guys, congratulations, you guys won the golden ticket in your life for this opportunity. And then that was actually, then fast forward a month later or yeah, two months later, we were supposed to go and film uh, on December 9th in Dubai, right? In 2016. And that all happened during the same time, my mom, you know, she's, her condition's getting worse. And then we got, and then my aunt calls me. She's like, hey, have you tried this doctor? I'm like, no, no. She's like, um, it's, 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 it's a failed case. You know, she's like, just try this doctor. You never know. I'm like, okay, cool. So I call this doctor that we go to the doctor with my mom. And uh, he comes out of nowhere, like the savior comes down. Like I see light around him. I'm like, what is this light? Whoa, what's going on? Right. And then he's like, so uh, um, he's like, so Madame Lamia, my mom. And he's like, have you, uh, have you considered uh, transplantation? And I'm like thinking to myself, you motherfucker, we, why are we here? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like thinking to myself. And he's like, uh, are any of your kids? And she's like, well, Hashem is, uh, was my donor, but then there's came out this problem. And then he says the name of the medical, you know, when you try to repeat the medical uh, <laughs> terminology after a doctor, you can't just nail it. He's like, yeah, it's the trifigular... I'm like, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. that's what I have. The trifigular artery dysfunction thingy. Can't donate to mom. He's like, well, uh, all the doctors that you saw are all wrong. I'm like, um, we went to the best doctor in Egypt. <laughs> like, what do you what do you want, bro? Because I want some of that shit. And he's like, that's not. I don't mean that that they're wrong. I mean that all of them. They when they do the transplant, they transplant from the right lobe. And because I transplant to children their right lobe isn't developed so we take from their left lobe and i think we can take from your left lobe so me doing my research i went back in time to that conversation with the doctor and when he re rejected me i was like i was telling him i was like why can't we take from the left lobe doctor uh back then and he's like her weight's not going to be enough it's not going to be for enough for her weight so then over the year and a half from 2015 from that meeting until like 2016 when we met that new doctor he was like uh What's it called? <laughs> he, um, her, she, she had deteriorated, so the, the weight was enough. So I went and I got, he's like, just get me the, the x-rays. and We'll figure it out. I'm like, okay, I'll go get the x-rays. So I'm literally going <laughs> and getting the x-rays because I don't know where they are. I've been to a million doctors. I don't know where I fucking left the x-rays. I find them and I come back to them and I, I feel like I was on Oprah because he puts him up and he's like mm -hmm. yeah okay all right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. congratulations you are the, are the donor you're gonna donate your liver you're gonna donate your liver and i'm like okay <laughs> great and then i became the donor and uh we said the the surgery for december right and i'm supposed to travel on december 9th for comedy central <laughs> yeah so then i'm like telling the doctor i'm like so listen i don't mean to be like a dick or anything i know she's dying i know she's my mom i'm closer you know but listen, but um, I kind of have like the biggest opportunity of my life coming up. So I, this is like one for the history books. 
So do you think in your professional medical, in your professional, you know, medical opinion, would I be able to travel in two weeks after surgery? Because, uh, or uh, would, I, would I be able to do that, right? And he's like, Psh, no problem, bro. Of course, you can, you'd be good, man. Dude, you can go on stage and do a fucking backflip. That's how awesome you're going to be, <laughs> right? And I'm like, all right, cool. You're the doc, right? So, the, so Comedy Central at that point, it was, had scheduled it for the 9th. And then uh, because the UAE's national holiday, they take 10 days. Uh, it's like on December 2nd. That's, right. their, uh, that's their like Independence Day or something. So they, in, so they take the whole week off. They take 10 days off. So it came in conflict with the scheduling and they couldn't get the visas for us to go and travel. So they're like, we're going to push production a month ahead to January and uh, to mid-January instead. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll get into, I'm like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah. They're like, yeah, don't worry. I'm like, it uh, sounds like you guys are bailing. But they're like, no, no, no. And that, that's when we spoke to the head of Comedy Central. And then, uh, and then we had scheduled the surgery for December 22nd, three days before Christmas, right? And then we, we both get admitted. And then um, I be, also became like a medical expert for some reason. I'm like a liver medical expert. Now I could read fucking charts, bro. I can read them, <laughs> right? So then uh, he's like, uh, we get admitted and stuff like that. And, uh, and while we're at the hos hospital, they have to make sure like the patient is 100% up in here. They're good. Physically, they're good. Everything is good, right? So there were some complications in, in those preparations. So they're like, you know what? We're just going to like push the surgery a month. And I'm like, uh, no, my production got pushed. I'm doing this right now. We're doing this. They're like, we can't operate on her. She has a collapsed lung. And I'm like, well, fix it then, dude. Like, I, I, got, I got to go, man. <laughs> Comedy Central, right? But in, in hindsight, in, uh, it's all joking, of course. I was, oh, fuck Comedy Central in the end. It was my mom. You know, that was the number one priority, right? He's like, listen, we really like to take into consideration people's schedules. I'm like, fuck the schedule, man. She's dying, bro. Like, she's dying. She's fucking dying. He's like, listen, no, no. She's not, she's not going to be too, too bad and not too good. She's going to be right in between. So go do your thing. I'm like, yeah, but the production is scheduled for mid-January. It's it's like me weeks. What's going to happen in two weeks, dog? What's going to happen? Right? And he's like, don't worry about it. You'll be cool. And I'm like, all right. So then uh, fast forward to, to Comedy Central and I'm going because I'm managing my comedians, right? Because I pick the comedians and I have to be there for the entire week. They have the schedule that every comedian comes, stays for 48 hours, performs and then bounces or performs and then stays and then leaves, right? And I'm there for the entire week from the 13th to the 19th. And then we do that. And everybody's like celebrating in Comedy Central that we just did the TV show and everything. Like, yeah, I'm like, I'm going back to surgery. Yay. <laughs> right. And uh, 48 hours after I came back, I came back on the 19th. Um, and then the surgery. And then I was like, hey, mom, everything is great and everything. And it was amazing. And then, and then I go to, uh, she, she had, a, she had a, a liver, uh, she had a hepatic coma. That's what happens with the liver because the liver is not, working so the for your non-medical uh, uh, listeners who are listening to this so the liver's function is to break down all the like the acids and all like the shit that your body has like so it can get rid of it and that's what the liver's function does you know takes care of that so she doesn't have that <laughs> anymore because she, obviously she has a deteriorating liver so then uh, she uh, she got into a hepatic coma right after like i came back on the 19th we celebrated she got a hepatic coma on friday and on Saturday, and we're like, what the fuck are we gonna do? Me and my brother were like, what the fuck are we gonna do? So we're, we started doing our like medical stuff to her, applying, giving her medicine and doing all these different uh, procedures, right? And then she finally comes to, but on like Saturday night, and then my brother has work on Sunday, <laughs> he has to go. He's like, yo, take mom to the, take to, to, for the checkup to the hospital and stuff like that. And that was on Sunday morning, because all the doctors are there. And then we're going and they're like, hey, how are you? I'm like, hey, she was just in a hepatic coma yesterday. And then the doctor's like, what? Because like, that means like ER, you have to go to the emergency room. You know, you have to go to ICU, not ICU, but you have to go to the ER. And they're like, wait, what? Why didn't you come yesterday? I'm like, yeah, we just took care of it. Dr. Hashem, nice to meet you. <laughs> I studied in the, the Comedy Institute, <laughs> right? And they're like, all right, that, that's amazing. Good job, guys. And then after that, uh, we... Uh, 
we they ask us to go like do to re up our samples, our blood samples. So me and her go downstairs to the to the lab to for to, to get blood samples. And then I called the doctor and he's like, Hey, did you guys do this? And he's like, Why don't you come up to the office? I'm like, We're still not done. He's like, just come up to the office. And then we're like, okay. <laughs> and then we go up. He's not there. So I call him, I'm like, yo, where you at? I'm at your office. He's like, so listen, uh, surgery uh, is this, it's gonna happen in, this, in the morning. And I'm like, what? I'm like, one in the morning. He's like, like four in the morning. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, uh, they're gonna pray the morning prayer and then we're gonna do certain work and then we're gonna open you up like a can of tuna. I'm like, are you, are you sure? <laughs> They're like, yeah, <laughs> that's great. Do that. And literally, man, 48 hours, you're on stage performing, making people laugh. And 48 hours, you're under the knife. And freaking, <laughs> this is the result. You know what I mean? Wow. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a big one, you know? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so that happened. And that was, uh, that was my, the beginning of my 2017, you know? <laughs> and... Uh, and then uh, she passed away seven months later after that surgery. Right. And then, uh, yeah, and then I just started like, okay, now I got to focus on comedy, you know, like, and then, uh, what's it called? 2018, I started, uh, I, uh, I went back to my origin of, because of Hezbollah Comedy is an open mic, it started as an open mic to get new talent. So I started uh, a friend of mine, he, he's like, hey, I got this venue. They're big fans of you guys. So uh, why don't you call him and stuff like that? And then we set up uh, an open mic every month and it started happening little by little, you know, uh, that open mic started attracting more because that's the original concept, right? And we still had our comedians, the guys at the Comedy Central, and we just started putting on more shows, uh, getting more venues because now I'm focused, you know, no, no more distractions of uh, having to deal with doctors or any of that. My mom, you know, may she rest in peace. She's, she's in a different place. So I'm just like, all right, cool. You know, it's all good. And then I started did, focusing. Did, you get to, did, did your mom get to, I mean, obviously, it's really tricky with mm. these situations where you've got mm. the best opportunity of your career. You're yeah. on a high on that sort of stuff. Yeah. It's fantastic. You're, you're carrying lots of these other guys and gals that took to yeah. terms you. Yeah. And then you've got that real issue where actually, yeah. in amongst all that comedy stuff, it yeah. must have been tearing you apart, wasn't it? I mean, I came up with really good jokes. You want to hear one of them? Yeah, of course. <laughs> so it... So I guess this is where my transition from being like the family friendly, uh, I'm still family friendly, don't get me wrong, but I guess my psyche changed at that point because comedy was for me, a, became a coping mechanism to deal with the circumstances because like in, like in the sequence of events, you have like uh, 2015, uh, it was, all that happened, like 2014 was the thing, it was 2014 was Edinburgh and Edinburgh opened the door for the for the Comedy International Conference yeah. and then that opened the door for, for Switzerland, for Montreal, yeah. where I met That's you. That's how we met. We, we love yeah. that. That was fantastic. Lots of yeah. cheese in that gag, which got you in yeah. trouble. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so that when, when, when all that happened, that was like the biggest thing. And then you're like constantly on, like on this up, you're like, boom, Edinburgh, London, Montreal. You're like, what the fuck is happening? And then crash down, mom is dying, deal with it right, for three years. And you're like, okay, well, now I have to deal with this. And that made me come to terms with being a more uh, darker comic. And I love it because the material, it's um, Dave Chappelle, he says that uh, if your comedy, the greatest comedy comes from the darkest places. And it comes so naturally to me, not to be like, not to be like a, a Debbie Downer or, a, or anything like that, but just to, to laugh at life because it's truly liberating when you laugh at your hardest times, you know? And I was saying this and I was saying, I donated a third of my liver to my mom, but she still won't do my laundry. Like what the fuck mom, it's a new liver. You're not supposed, you're supposed to be more energetic, you know? And people, exactly, people would react that way, but it was my coping mechanism to deal with, with that. And I, I realized that carried over because there's a lot of death been happening lately. <laughs> like I've been hearing about it and uh, we, we just lost an, uh, so I just lost someone, a cl very close friend. He was, he was my family mechanic, right? And then, because uh, here in Egypt, you have a guy for everything, right? So he was the guy, but we got really close. He's like an older brother and he passed away, right? And I, <laughs> I was telling my friend this on the phone. I was like, man, the first thing that came to my mind, I was like, damn it, what's going to happen when my car breaks down? God damn it. <laughs> Who am I going to call? I'm like too soon. But it's my way of dealing with it because I miss him and I, 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 I genuinely feel, you know, like that he, he's gone too soon. But like at the end of the day, it became a coping mechanism, a strong, very coping mechanism. Because I was like, you know what? If we can't laugh in death. And, and you've got to do it. And actually, it's what they always yeah. say is that yeah. people who are gone, 
They'd much yeah. rather you celebrated their life than went around miserable. Exactly, 100%. 100%. And that's why I started doing just jokes about my mom. And at that time, uh, when my, after my mom passed away, um, <laughs> I, there was a joke that was born but about my grandmother who, uh, who lived uh, to be 100 years old, right? And in, Arab, and in, in Egypt and in the Middle East, we have a saying, um, every time someone has a birthday, we tell them the following, tell them, Bel Mitzana, which means on, uh, wishing you until, uh, wishing you another birthday until you're 100. But it's a, it's a formality, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so then I came up with this joke because I was sitting with my dad talking one time and I was like, hey, did you tell, um, did you tell, did you tell grandma happy birthday? And he's like, uh, uh, I'm like, he's like, no. He's like, what do you expect me to tell you? You expect me to tell her, oh, I can't wait till you reach 100, mom. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, that's comedy gold. And he's like, he, I started laughing, break, bursting out. Because like, it's in Arabic, right? It makes more sense in Arabic, right? And I just started bursting. And he's like, what are you laughing about? And I'm like, dude, you just gave me comedy genius. And then I started to link that to, like, how old people want to die and how sick people want to fight for life, right? And that just became one of my best bits <laughs> about grandma. <laughs> that what we can't tell her that, hey, we can't wait to see you at 100 because she can't even fucking remember. And then it turns out that he stopped telling her when she was 95. <laughs> They're like, no, we stopped telling her, of course. I'm like, no one sent me the fucking memo. <laughs> Nobody sent me an email telling me, hey, we're going to stop telling grandma <laughs> happy birthday at 95. And, and it just became so liberating to be able to laugh at just, Anything, you know what I mean? Even I, at that, that. And that, that's exactly it, isn't it? It is that yeah. release mechanism because people crave 100%. that. It's either that, yeah. it's either the extremes of emotion where you're just in tears yeah. all the time. Yeah. Or yeah. you've no. got to laugh it off. And if well, you some people do that. Yeah. Some people tell me I need therapy, but I'm like, uh, some people are like, you really need to talk to a shrink about that because when we see your performance, when we see it, you're, it's not in your eyes. It just, you're so sad. And I'm like, um, yes, I am, but I'm laughing about it because. I'm choosing not to be sad because if I chose to be sad, yeah. then I'm just going to inevitably, that's going to be my, my paradigm in life. I'm going to be sad every time someone passes away. And oh, like you said. And you find that. And sometimes the most dramatic, most miserable of moments, like the, the mm. deepest, hardest thing, you have to bite your tongue so you don't laugh because people will just find it inappropriate. So I can see how that sort of humor. But yeah. I, you that's what you, at the funeral, thing, did your mum get to see you on, on television? Did she get to see you on, on the Comedy Central? Yeah, funny story. We didn't, uh, <laughs> we didn't, we weren't subscribed to that service. But she, I saw her. I showed her like the pictures of uh, of being on stage and stuff. But uh, but yeah, but I'm happy that at least because uh, being the product of Egyptian parents, uh, obviously they expect you like any uh, you know anyone coming from the Middle East or India or any of those you know um, backgrounds. They expect you to be a doctor or or an, yeah. like my dad wanted me to be an accountant like him. You know, yeah. obviously, and. Uh, I'm just happy that all my entire, because at that time, uh, Comedy Central was exactly what, like uh, six years after starting of Hezbollah Comedy going on, uh, maybe six, eight, yeah, six years after starting to do my, my own thing, but like eight years as a comic or maybe seven years as a comic as performing stand-up and, and, and just going and on that journey and like, hey, look, um, no, people are calling me to fly out to a different country to do my thing. Now, do you believe in me, mom? <laughs> now, do you, you know, so I'm happy that she got, she got to saw that she, she acknowledged that, you know, that I'm happy that it happened. And uh, pretty much like after that in 2019, um, 2018, we started bringing back the shows, 2019, more shows, more venues. Uh, last year was an amazing year. We did over 100K in ticket sales. And then I told my dad, he's like, you didn't do shit. And I'm like, daddy, no. <laughs> you know, uh, he's like, how much did you make in your pocket? And I'm like, dude, I made 100K in revenue. That's more than enough. Don't judge me. Like, does Amazon go out and say, oh, we made this much in profit? They didn't profit for 25 years, man. Give me some fucking break, bro. <laughs> you know, but then it's all in good faith because, you know, he's a concerned father and everything. But uh, 2019 was amazing. We, opened, we, we took it up because in that period where I was telling you from 2014, the shows were like maybe two, three, two a month, maybe three if we got lucky. And then in 2019, last year, we were doing like six, seven, eight shows a month. Every week we have like two shows, new venues, we're getting popular and stuff like that. And, uh, and because we're the household name for stand-up comedy in Egypt, we're the first official platform, we're Egypt's comedy factory, you know, as you read in the bio. So I had to hold up my end i'm like this is my work i don't have to deal with any you know any drama or anything or a sick mother anymore i get to focus on my work 
and uh, and 2020 it just carried over because we were having so many shows and i started 2020 the most amazing year of my even better than 2014 where i did all that stuff what i did edinburgh and london because we got invited to the to uh, to the Sharjah Fringe Festival, which is the first time it's the organizers, um, these organizers for South Africa that produce shows in Edinburgh, right? They decided to team up with the Sharjah uh, uh, government because they wanted to bring something to their city that's not in Dubai, that's not, you know, Dubai is all glamour. Uh, Sharjah is more like family oriented, there's there is a family um, there and stuff like that. And they don't have any activities. They had just have like, light festival they don't have anything like entertaining you know what i mean and they're like well we're gonna do we're gonna do the, the charge of fringe festival so then um someone that uh came to egypt he wanted to collaborate with us he's a saudi comic may god bless him because he's the one that opened up that door you know and uh and then he wanted to book us for his show over there and i was like wait a minute i'm not i'm not like gonna fall for this this is you know i'm very cautious and then i was i realized i was like because he was dealing with uh at that time, actually, in 2019, I was filming a movie. Um, I'm the first. Uh, I, I'm. I'm uh, I participated in the first Egyptian animated uh, cartoon movie dubbed in English. An oh, Egyptian movie. And what was that about? It's called The Night and the Princess. It's. Uh, I was. So I had a recording then. So then I had to send my right hand, Walid, to deal with this guy, this Saudi guy, that right. was telling us, "Hey, uh, we want to collaborate and stuff like that." This is way before the festival. And then uh, Walid, uh, my, my VP, he calls me. He's like, hey, man, uh, the Saudi guy, he, he's, Mr. Moshab, is telling me that uh, there's this festival and that's going to happen and stuff he wants us. And I'm like, whoa, okay, stop. Get me his contact information right now. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him. You know, because he's like, he sent us like a performance thing and I was like, he wants us obviously on his show. And I was like, wait, if this is the fringe, I can produce my own show. I'm already an alumni of the Edinburgh, so I'm going to produce my own goddamn show. So then, uh, so he's like, okay, hold on. Uh, okay, so I got in touch with that Saudi guy. And I'm like, hey, is there any way that you can hook me up with the festival directly? Huh. And he's like, yeah, cool, you can. Uh, I can definitely for sure. Literally sends me the WhatsApp content. He's like, here's the guy and stuff. And that's what I'm saying. God bless this guy that came out of nowhere, right? And before we know it, like, uh, we're like panicking. We're like, okay. Well, you seem to have frozen for a little bit. I think the connection. I'm testing. Oh, you're back with this. You keep freezing every now and again. It's sort of. I'm, I'm, like some, it's, it's, I'm doing that stop thing animation. It looks good. You're good. Uh, you're back. You're back with us. Okay. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so then uh, he he gets in touch. Uh, I get in touch with the festival. Yeah. With the with the guy that's dealing with the festival directly, and I'm like, here, yeah, this is my profile. This is and this. Can we produce a show? He's like, yeah, of course. So then we produced. Uh, so so then we came up with an idea for a show, and I got the comedians. This time it was only like four comedians. Um, mm -hmm. Um, it's different than Comedy Central, obviously, because this was a tour uh, yeah. inst instead of like uh, instead of just like doing a TV show. It's different. I'm like, okay, I got to go back to Edinburgh tactics. You know what I mean? Like what I've learned in Edinburgh, I got to do this right now. And I noticed like the marketing for the festival wasn't all that. And I was like, are you sure this is gonna happen? You know that you have that kind of like, you know, those two cents in the back of your, you know, you're like thinking, oh, is it gonna happen? Is it really gonna happen? Is it not gonna happen? And that was until like we traveled, and then. In January started, I'm having shows in my regular shows. I have like six, seven shows booked and they're all getting sold out. I'm like, yes, this is a great start to 2020, right? And then I'm like, okay, if this festival happens, if it's, if it's bullshit, then whatever, we'll just continue what we're doing. If it's not, then whatever, we'll just go for it. You know what I mean? Um, and we'll just continue our streak. And then before it was the last week, we had got the confirmation. They sent us the visas, and then we're like, "All right, cool." And we named the show. Uh, we we named the show something that very relevant for them to get to understand that there's Egyptians in town. And we started. I started like a huge marketing campaign. I just paid off my marketing campaign <laughs> right now because of everything that got fucked. You know, I just literally like I just literally got paid from the festival um, recently, and. Uh, we did a campaign and we're like, wait a minute, Sharjah is close to Dubai. And let's, uh, why not turn this thing into a tour? So then one of my comedians, he's like, yo, I'll take up this task. Got in touch with organizers in Dubai. He's like, hey, I heard you guys are doing tours there, uh, doing shows in, in these places. Can you hook us up with these places? Literally, he sends the WhatsApp contacts and, uh, to, the, to the place. We're dealing with the place. We launched the event. We got the slot. And uh, that week from the 23rd all the way to the 30th shows every single day, like 
uh, sh- we, we, we came on Friday and then Saturday was the first show in Sharjah and then Dubai was on, sorry, Saturday was the first show. Sunday is in Dubai. So you go from Sharjah to Dubai and then go back on Monday to, the, to back to, to Sharjah and it's a different Emirate, you know what I mean? And then you have to go back and then Tuesday you go back to Dubai and then we sold out the show, the first show in Dubai and then we added the second show on Tuesday. It was, we just meant for one show. And then we're like, okay, let's add a third show. Getting really popular because the ads are going. People are like, oh shit, they're excited. There's an Egyptian community. There's an Arab community. Egyptians are known uh, because Egypt's like the Hollywood of the Middle East. Oh, so is that okay? Egypt, yeah. So e- Egyptians, all the all the all the Arabs, they speak. They understand the the Egyptian dialect because right. because of it being like the Hollywood of the Middle East since the 1930s. That's what was exported to the to the Gulf. At the time, it was just being built. The Gulf was just still being established. You know what I mean? Saudi and the Emirates and all these different places. So Egypt was the one that was on top of its shit at that time throughout that era. That was the golden era. And that's why the logo of, uh, of al Hizbil comedy is the, the Fez. The Fez represents a very, uh, the golden era of the renaissance of, of Egypt. And then I put the microphone on it instead of the tassel to represent our voice, you know, after the revolution and all that, right? So... So then I was like, uh, so so everybody understands the the, the Egyptian dialect, and uh, and at that point uh, we were advertising the show. We we're like, we're gonna be in Dubai and stuff like that. And then the festival, the last show was on Thursday, and then we were, and the guy was telling us, hey, there's another thing like a, a conference, a panel like similar to what we did in Switzerland, and uh, and they're like, no, we it got canceled, and we were. After we had added the third show on Friday and started getting reservations, we we're almost about to sell out the third show then we had back to Cairo and then boom and then fucking came back to Cairo did more shows uh they were a little bit you know like a little they weren't all sold out but I was just like whatever I just came back from a fucking sold out tour I'm not upset <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> and then fucking the last show was on March 9th right before uh corona officially became a thing on that the, the night of that show I remember that people uh what's it called that the, the government uh, the Egyptian government came out they're like hey we're kind of like banning mass gatherings right now because of the coronavirus. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, thank God that announcement came on the last show that I'm ever going to do. Right? No, it, it, it is extraordinary, that sort of thing. So it sounds like you were a little bit before. Right now, was, yeah. So you're a bit before yeah. us because we, we had ours on March the 23rd when we had lockdown. So when was it in, in Egypt? No, lockdown for us didn't officially start until... Uh, the 15th of March, I think. 15th was it the but still, a co- no, no, 10 days before no, us. Sorry, before us. Yeah. No, sorry, sorry. The 15th of March was... No, 15th of March was the first order of schools getting shut down and universities getting shut down. Okay. The official, the official like, uh, lockdown... We don't have a 24-hour lockdown, by the way. Like, the lockdown today just got extended till 8 o'clock, 8 p.m. But uh, we don't have a 24-hour one. But, yeah, it was around that time. Uh, everything just... That was it. And I was like, okay, now what do I do? <laughs> you know, like, now, you know, and, and now we're here. And then I started the TikTok account to just keep... Just, just to keep, keep talking. So talk, talk to me then, Hashem, about what are the rules in Egypt? Because they, they vary. I've been talking to people around the world, from Zambia to Australia and, uh, and wow. back again, and all the places in between. And everybody around the world is changing the different rules and regulation. They're all a bit confusing, you know. What, yeah. What's going on in Egypt? What, what are the rules? Rules right now that we had the... the Eid, uh, because it was right after Ramadan, we had the Eid celebrations, our Christmas, right? And uh, the government said to, in order to, to just put that to the side uh, so that we, we make sure that the spread doesn't get to, because it's like family gatherings and all that. It's like- I know, it know, must be really difficult during that. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so they made the curfew. Yeah. yeah, so they made the curfew at 5 p.m. instead, you know, instead of, so they can kind of, and they closed all the beaches, everything, you know, all the vacation spots mm-hmm. and all that. And they just kind of tighten their group on 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 that just to make sure that the people are um, it doesn't spread as much, and that's basically it. And of course, stand up is not going to happen anytime soon. And, but, and that's uh, so you had a curfew because we didn't have a curfew system here. We had this no, really had strange thing about uh, uh, well, stay at home. It started off as that sort of stuff. It's stay at home, and then that got changed fairly recently to stay alert. Because <laughs> you think, yeah. well, what, what does yeah. that mean? We understand stay at home, but stay alert. Yeah, right, well, well, right now you ha- yeah, right now they uh, they're enforcing like you have to wear the the mask in your car. Right. You have to wear it uh, in public, any public space. You have to wear a mask, 
And I'm like, this is the strangest time. Like when I was getting the money from the festival last week, <laughs> yeah. I went into the bank wearing the fucking mask. Oh my God. I look like Clive Owen from Inside Man, <laughs> about to rob the place down. And I was just like, Aah! you know, with my mask on. I'm That's like, nice. um, what, are you guys going to open anytime soon so I can get my money legally? Huh? I'm not yeah. threatening it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was just like that. But yeah, so I guess the world is starting to adjust. I think this is going to be our life for the next... Uh, it, it, it is extraordinary. Bit. And I've been talking... So your sort of principles were um, you had curfew. So you had times that you could go out. Because what we yeah, had from, here is you could... Uh, if you're an essential worker, you can carry on working. So you're a doctor or, or a cleaner or yeah. something useful like a, a, a bus, yeah. bus driver, you can carry on working. The yeah, schools, same here. The schools closed down. The restaurants yeah. closed down. Yeah. So if you had, if you were a kid of an essential worker, you, you still went to school, but everybody else was taught remotely. Is that, is that? Did you have the same sort of thing? I don't know about the like the essential workers, the ones that live on a daily budget. That are, they're the ones that are working every day. Everybody else is staying at home because just to, to the spread. It depends. Like you can go out. Like I can go out right now until eight o'clock. I'll be cool. But. Uh, Again, it's just taking those precautions. I have a dad, you know, that uh, he's 63 years old. So I'm cautious with that. I'm like, I already lost a parent. So <laughs> I'm going to fuck with that, you know. Yeah. So um, for me, um, I guess it's just trying to adjust to that. And everybody kind of putting out their warnings. But because economically, that's not feasible for any country in the world to remain in lockdown. <laughs> So I see that every country right now is opening up with the restrictions, and that's well, what we're doing. They're trying to, and, and we've still got the rules right. They're all about wash your hands, and you've got to stay two yeah. meters apart, but they might be one meter because they're they're trying to work out how, how far yeah. that that will spread. Um, but and they're now trying to get groups of six together because they can then track. We've got this thing here where we're talking about an app where you can track whether you've been close to somebody who's been infected. It's not like having those old bells they used to have when you've got the plague, you know, unclean, unclean. So you get, you get this app to tell people if you've caught yeah. the virus, then you can work out who you've been in close proximity to, um, to work okay. out whether they've got it as well. Then they have to self-isolate it. It all gets a bit bizarre like that. I mean, and this will, honestly, like, if you're just, if you're healthy, if you're young, um, um, and I, I, it's only the asymptomatic people that, uh, like, I had a cough, yesterday but i'm a smoker so <laughs> i'm like that's not you know i'm like that's not that covid you know what i mean like yeah. and i think it's just more uh, honestly and um, the fear is just for the older well it's it's it seems to i mean you say the elder people that there are a lot of people which are not just the elderly but but others they talk yeah. about underlying symptoms and things like that. there's a lot of confusion in the media as to what's going on yeah. What, what is clear is that different people around the world are approaching it slightly differently. They're talking about the social distancing. They're talking about yeah. washing your hands. Yeah. I guess in your place, your, 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 the restaurants are closed. Yeah, 100%. Um, the, 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 the malls market, started opening cinemas, up. Cinemas, all that sort of stuff. But I talked to my brother in Dubai yesterday. My brother just got engaged yesterday. Shout out to my brother. We had, a, we had a, his engagement on Zoom. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. so, oh, no, sorry, Microsoft meetings. Sorry. Oh, that is good. That is good. There are other platforms available. It's yeah, yeah. It's his work platform. I'm like, did you record it? He's like, no, man, it would have been uploaded to my work cloud. I'm like, I said, oh, don't worry, I didn't record it. Are you going to record your, your, your engagement? I recorded it. I did my oh, you did. Oh, well done. Yes. I, I set up my tactics, you know, and, uh, and he said that the curfew right now in Dubai was at 8, and they just pushed it to 11, and the... Uh, and they're reopening, and the public beaches are open, and they're slowly reopening. So I we, guess don't, we don't have curfews here. So I, I know in a number of countries, like Barbados, there's, I talked to some people over there in Australia and so on and so forth. Yeah. They have a curfew. You're allowed in at certain times, and they were doing mm. it alphabetically. So, so you work, if you're A, you can go out from here to here, and then you yeah. work through the alphabet eventually. We don't have that. So it's basically, it was all about social distancing. That was the big thing we were told. Social distancing, stay, stay so two meters apart, and, and wash your hands when you keep uh, coming wash in. Wash your hands. Birthday twice, that sort of stuff is what you do. So. Like the stuff that we learned growing up. It's like, wash your hands when you get yeah. home. It's like, this is, like, ABC, like, who, unless you're, like, someone that doesn't have that education that, to wash your hands when you go back home like i grew up yeah. to that but maybe because i grew up in the states so i guess that was the main thing you know but um other than that i think everybody's fighting their own inner struggle you know with this whole thing whether it's yeah. be like like my aunt for example she's locked down her family ever since this whole thing like they don't leave the house nobody comes in like it was ramadan a month like recently and this is the time when families would would go right and she knows that I live by myself, for example, and I just go have a store with my dad, for example, right? 
every year she's extending that invitation. I didn't get that call this year. You know, she's like, no, I'm in isolation. No one comes in. No one come, goes out. And I'm like, are you guys really that scared? She's like, yeah, I already have health issues. Fuck that. I'm not going to put my, myself or my kids under that. You know, I don't, I don't have the energy to deal with that. So it's better just I stay in. And then she hasn't been out, you know, for the past, again, for the past two months. And again, it depends on perspective. I go out and I deal with, with people. Of course, it's to a, a minimal interaction. I don't, I don't um, you know, go and find people that are coughing. Like, hey, man, can you cough on me, bro? I'm like, no, I don't do that, obviously. But uh, it's just for the essentials, you know. So again, it's, a, it's about perspective. I think uh, the media did a really good job at scaring the shit out of people. <laughs> and and you that's know? worldwide. Nothing spreads yeah. faster than fear. You know, that, that's, yeah, that's, 100%. that's the paranoid, um, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, what's, it, they, what's it called? Regarding that, they, uh, what's it called? I, th- I, was, I, was doing a, I was doing a friend's show yesterday, a comedy show called The Interruption Show. And I did a joke. I was like, you, you notice like people didn't take it seriously because they were just calling it coronavirus and that was associated with it. The moment the media started saying, calling it COVID-19, everybody's like, oh, what the fuck is that? <laughs> and like, COVID-19 is spreading at a severe alarming late. Like, oh. <laughs> everybody got fucking shit scared. And I was one of those people, honestly, to, to, uh, in the beginning, I was completely against it. I even made a clip uh, of, uh, of a, a meme of, uh, of Dave Chappelle's uh, Chappelle show. He had a clip when he was playing... Uh, uh, the president and he's like uh, and he's like uh, telling everybody to, to, he was telling the media and the in the sketch he's like shut the fuck up it's like all the media need to shut the fuck up so I was like so I made a meme regarding that right. and then in hindsight when I look at it I was like wow they really succeeded to scaring the shit out of people oh, absolutely and, and that's what yeah. happens and then all these yeah. we have tremendous conspiracy theories like it's a, it came from 5G <laughs> or, or there's disinfectant yeah. <clears throat> involved all that sort oh of my, rubbish, you know? oh my god I saw, I, even in the UK you, you've heard of London Real of course I'm yeah. sure you have yeah so yeah and he's getting censored and I don't know nobody even knows what the fuck is going on honestly like <laughs> my dad's like, uh, I'm like, uh, I was talking to my dad. And I'm like, yeah, so basically, uh, he's like, so basically it's going to be the same shit that we're living in. I'm like, I guess I, because uh, uh, my, my, my brother right now lives in the States, right? Whereabouts in the States is he? Is he? Uh, he's is in he, Texas. Texas. Okay. He's in Austin. Yeah. Austin. So, and he's like, and he's telling my dad, he's like, this is not the States that I grew up in. Like, because in the nineties, we grew up in the nineties and that was the glorious time to grow up in, you know? Yeah. And, and it's not the same. And, and then now Americans are realizing this, not my brother, but, but, but they're just realizing this, that there's this just huge change that we didn't see growing up. Like nobody has ever seen anything like this. So I guess, like I said, uh, everybody has their own idea of what's going on. And anybody could go on Facebook and say bullshit and uh well they do you say that anybody could they do i mean well, well, had, had a few months ago people forget this we had brexit and everybody yeah. who was a constitutional expert a few weeks ago are now the best virologists you've ever imagined yeah they all <laughs> have their theories they all tell you this is what's caused it this is what's going to happen it's uh, it's extraordinary yeah i mean I, everybody has an opinion the social media just gave everybody an opinion just to do it uh, I, 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 I went to Facebook jail recently. <laughs> I got my bear. Oh, yeah. what, what did you say? You're always going to. You're nothing. Oh, nothing, well. I, nothing. Nothing at all. I, did, I don't even use Facebook to, to like make like, like to make a valid art. Like, honestly, do you want the only time Facebook rewarded me for like an engaging post was yeah. when my mom passed away. <laughs> like when people oh, were telling me, I swear to God, <laughs> like I swear. And then the second most engaging time is when I announced that I was in that movie, the first animated Egyptian movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, so in essence, people don't give a fuck unless you're talking against the paradigm. So I don't talk because I don't give a fuck, to be honest. I just want to live And, and the, the other thing is people are so obsessed with likes, aren't they? Just being on the social media. Yeah. You sit there waiting for the first person to like whatever ridiculous post yeah, you it's, out it's there. Dopamine, the, the, one of the, the people that was the social engineers that was working on Facebook, yeah. we designed it so it could be like dopamine, so you can get that hit man and you know and and that's what it is and everybody has an opinion and until now i 
I don't like social media. I hate social media, but I know that I have to be on it because I'm a comic. <laughs> so well, you've got to uh, talk about it. Yeah. You've got to tell people. Yeah, exactly. But but when I when honestly when I believe that my platform is not big enough for me to talk or to have a, a very big voice because uh, not fear of getting silenced or anything, but because in order to make a big change, you have to have a very big following. You know yeah. what I mean? And even amongst that following, people will disagree with you. You know what I mean? Yeah, but and, but and you that, want controversy. If you don't have controversy, there's no debate. And if everybody just says, oh, yeah, that's right, you've got to shock. I mean, you've got to shock people. That's the thing about comedy. They all say, look, you find out where the line is and you go beyond it, don't you? I mean, that, that's, no, you, that's well, the well, 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 see, in, in, in places in the Middle East, in countries in the Middle East, um, there are fewer restrictions with, with that being said. And I always believe that uh, comedy is not meant to attack. Comedy is meant to, um, to make you think. Just to make you think. I'm not attacking an institution. I'm not attacking a person using comedy. I'm not going to make fun. Because that's a that's an easy way, right? To to to, to yeah. do an, a, a joke on it's easier. They, there's a saying in Arabic. Uh, it says basically, it, I'll translate it for you. It's easier to be, um, it's easier to be an asshole than it is. The, basic it's basic translation. It's easier to be an asshole than it is to be respected. And what what is the Arabic you know? for that? So, Just so I know for next time I need it. <laughs> next time, yeah. um, it says uh, what's it called? Uh, Illitil adab, which means like uh, lack of respect or disrespect. Ashal um, min adab. It's easier than respect, than giving respect. So, so it is definitely easy to make controversy and say a post, and I believe in this conspiracy theory and all that. But fuck it, you know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't care, man. I just want to live in peace. If I, if I have a, you know, just if I, if I'm able to, for me, I'm not about uh, making any stir online unless it's an amazing sketch that I wrote. You know what I mean? Sure. I, I don't believe that, uh, like I said, that comedy should be used to, to attack the, just maybe just to give your point of view. And, and there's so much shit that you can talk about with comedy. And because the narrative is, oh, let's talk about this. I can, I can make a joke about uh, all the con conspiracy theories. I can make all that shit about how people think that we're, we're all going to be controlled, how this all thing is going to unfold. Can make, it's easy to make that joke, you know what I mean? But it's easier to, to make a joke about the everyday life that we're going through because it's more relatable as opposed to making someone, oh, think about, oh my God, or, or is this a whole conspiracy? What's going to happen to humanity? Right. Um, humanity's been around for the past fucking... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, and it's, it's what we said beforehand though, isn't it? Because people need that escape. They need to be able to know that there's that How comic release when you get all the pressure on you. So the, the, the comics are the ones who are really, there's big, big responsibility yeah. on your shoulders, isn't there? I mean, honestly, um, I've been trying to figure out this whole thing to how, to, how do I monetize from this? And uh, yeah. we did, I, we did the, on like two weeks ago, the, the 24 hour comedy festival, if you heard about it, right? Yeah, so we did, yeah, yeah. yeah, so we did that. We were representing Egypt and stuff like that. And uh, it was cool. And to have that escape and then, Honestly, uh, it was fun just to be hanging out with your friends just like this, you know, and just doing your jokes or whatever. But at the same time, I know that in Egypt, there is that still that boundary of people wanting uh, shit for free. So they think that, oh, why should I pay for your Zoom uh, thing? You know, this is not a show. This is not a, you know, they, it, it's very undermined because for the past 10 years, what I've been doing, I've been educating people on what stand-up comedy is and now i'm just falling in the same thing again now i have to now the, now i have to explain to them that i'm doing comedy on zoom and they have to pay for it they're like fuck you buddy you know what i mean <laughs> like, like it, so, it is it is really difficult Hashem, as well and yeah. what, what we find i've been talking to lots of major rock artists around the world who are supposed to be yeah. on their on their major tours performing in front of tens if not hundreds of thousands they're all yeah. locked down in yeah. the same way that we are and talking this sort of basis. And I don't know if you saw it, but they had this Lady Gaga organized concert where they had all the major musicians were playing from their living room and they had the stones and they were put the four stones in each little block. And you had Charlie Watts playing the drums on effectively the saucepans <laughs> or something. Like that. And it was brilliant. And you see that all of that's cut down. But there's a, there's a, it's like a drug, if you like. There's a, a, you need your live fix, don't you? And if you don't yeah. have a comedy audience laughing with you, that must be really tough. It is because uh, the, the guy that actually gave us uh, the, the gig on the, for the comedy festival, he told us, uh, get like 10 or 20 people with their cameras on and their audio on. But if you get more than that, turn off, mute all the other people. And I'm like, 
I mean, that's, he's like, it's a designated audience that you're creating. So it doesn't, so you cut out all the feedback and all that. And I'm thinking to myself here in Egypt, they call that a rented audience. You know what I'm saying? That you pay them, you get them here, like come attend the show, laugh when we tell you and we'll pay you, you know, and that's that concept. So when I, when I think about that in hindsight, I'm like thinking to myself, I'm like, ah, I don't want to like, you know, I, it's very difficult to convince people already that we were doing stand-up comedy for the past 10 years to do this stand-up comedy. Now it's known, but now making that transition in order to be like, hey, we're doing it on- online. Can you come pay for this? And most people are not going to fucking pay. Well, for I this. guess I mean, the other good thing about it, and what we mm-hmm. touched on as well, it gives you a global audience. Because yeah, just 100%. the same way, I, as you say beforehand, yeah. Egypt is the Hollywood of the Middle East. That's what you say. Yeah. And the, comedy... And- it wasn't really known for comedy until you, and the reason you became so attractive, you suddenly said, look, I'm from Egypt, I'm a comedian. Yeah. It's, it's brilliant. So people yeah. say, this is unusual, let's yeah. put it on our bill. Well, well yeah, I mean, I, I, right now I'm trying to create like a, a program. I don't know like a, if you would be able to help with this, but I'm basically trying to get people to do like one-on-one sessions with me where they are, uh, I do, I, I teach, um, I teach public speaking through stand-up comedy. Oh, go on then. What what are your top tips then? Go on, give us a public speaking teacher. I like this. Public speaking. I didn't know you did. You do everything. What I love, what I love in the the CV you send over, having not seen you for a little while. You said I'm I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and a comedian. And what do you call it? A contrepreneur? Comediapreneur. Comediapreneur. We love it. We love it. Yeah. uh, Because because I was, honestly, I, I always say this, I'm born to be a comic. Yeah. but also meant to be an entrepreneur because I love the stage, you know, I, it's my drug, you know, and, uh, and being an entrepreneur is kind of like in my blood. My dad was an entrepreneur. Um, I, I did in the States, me and my brother had a website. I used to write Photoshop tutorials. He used to write PHP tutorials. We had a okay. company called Limitless Studios. This was back in like 2002 when Google AdSense started to yeah, happen. Yeah. And we made a we made a hundred dollars from AdSense. A hundred dollars, you see, those days. In 2002, in 2002, man, in 2002, 2003. Yeah. So, so, so my responsibility, I, I guess it was, being a comic wasn't enough for me just like to do a comic. And because I'm always, I'm a marketing major. So I was like, I need to come up with an idea. And at the time, obviously, um, it, it Hezbollah Comedy was born during a time of revolution in Egypt where everybody was coming up with an idea. And I'm like, if I don't do this now, I'm going to get left behind and I'm going to regret it. And I did. I, made, I said, I'm going to make one event on Facebook at the time mm-hmm. and, uh, and see if it works out. If it doesn't, then at least I gave it a shot. If it does, see what happens. And, 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 but you also then accumulated lots of other comics because I imagine that they, they were all looking for, for extra gigs and where they can go. How, I mean, how big is, is the, the comedy uh, team? Yeah, how big is your team? But no, there's a difference between the size of my team and the size of uh, the, the, the industry itself. Um, okay. my, 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 my direct team is like maybe four, five people. You say um, maybe four. I mean, you can count that. <laughs> you're there. You're there. No, 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 I'm saying my direct team. The person who might be out this week. Is no, no, my, my direct team that I work with on, yeah. on, on like, like that help me manage the shows and stuff. Okay. Like that. okay. You know what I mean? That's like maybe two, three people, four people. Yeah. But uh, the comics that I've dealt with over the years, like, from the open mics to actually uh, to, to coaching some of them to uh, for them to some of them, like one of my the guy that was just calling right now he yeah. just got a, he he got a TV show in in Ramadan because he did a video it went viral right people saw it they offered him a TV show and he was on on, on in Ramadan in a prime hour he was he got a TV show now he's like he got his foot in the door for example. And he's directly from my team. So to see that, that's an amazing thing. To see myself starring in the first Egyptian animated movie and uh, having my name alongside the Arabic, like basically, um, he's, he's a huge name in comedy in Egypt. You know what I mean? And, and that was my counter. You know, that's the, guy, the part that I'm doing. And people were telling me, yo, you outperformed him in the English. People told me that. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> so all these opportunities, when you see that, these are coming your way because of of you doing stand-up and or and being at the right place at the right time it's it's amazing to see that so the and um there's the people that you work with that went and they got signed by other people for example by other producers they're on tv now you know uh, they're writing they're in workshops and writing workshops for tv shows now so it's amazing to be in the beginning of all that because that's just the foundation the stem if you look at the industry in the uk in the 70s or in the states that's how it started you know the comedians and then eventually comedy central formed in the 90s 
because it was it was made for stand-up comedians by stand-up comedians for stand-up comedians so that was kind of my goal to kind of start educating the people in the beginning what stand-up comedy is and that was the past 10 years and now i'm entering phase two <laughs> digital stand-up <laughs> you know <laughs> so but, we'll but, see but but also you mentioned beforehand i mean you grew up the, a large part of your uh, younger years was in the states yeah. i grew up in i but the larger part of my uh, of my life right now is in Egypt, obviously, because I've been here for 17 years. Uh, and my upbringing from five until 16, I was in the States. Yeah, uh, so, so you got so influenced a lot by the American comics. 100%, my, 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 my brain is, <laughs> I always say I have a white guy possessed in my brain. A, pe a white guy possesses my brain, his name is Jeff. <laughs> and he bullies yeah. me and stuff. Yeah, and that's my whole thing. What? So when Jeff came back to Egypt, <laughs> What was the state of comedy in Egypt when you arrived from the States? No idea because I was a foreigner, you know, I had right. no idea. Like I started doing stand-up in Egypt. I didn't start in, in the States. In the States, I knew what it was. I watched it. I grew up to it. Uh, Eddie Izzard was one of the first comedians that I really grew fond of because my parents loved it. They, uh, they, they had Dress to Kill on HBO and right. they taped it in the time of VCRs. And... Uh, and that was, I was, and, and my dad would ask this question and I would, I would ask this question to my dad, like, how, how did they stay on stage for so long knowing all this? Like, it was fascinating for me. And then when in 2007, uh, an uh, ethnic group of uh, comedians called the Axis of Evil was consisting of uh, Ahmad Ahmad, and Maz Jibrani and Aaron Kader and all these people, they came into, uh, they, they, they blew up in the States. And then they uh, they decided to do a Middle Eastern tour to showcase the world that Arabs laugh, you know, yeah. are capable of laughing. And then one of their stops was in Cairo. So they had auditions and that was the first time I ever did stand up. And I was like, you know, because at that point I was, I was, it was my fourth year in Egypt. So I was like, okay, no, but no Egyptian understands me. I, I, my, my language is very, very broken, obviously, because I haven't been speaking this for I, English is, Jeff was taking over my head at that time, you know? Yeah. So, so I wasn't speaking and I was like, oh, this is an American audience. They have an American sense of humor. They're, no, they're gonna choose me definitely because I'm an American, you know? Like I, I grew up there, they know that sense of humor, they're gonna identify with it, it's gonna be relatable. And then I go on stage and I do my shit for the first time, you know? I just, on the way there, I'm just, uh, my friend that drove me there, I'm just going over, I'm like, is this funny? Is this funny? I think I'm about doing this, I'm saying this. And, and in, t in terms of the material that you do, I mean, obviously having grown up with the American side as well. Um, one thing I noticed when I, I was chair of the Montreux Comedy Festival is there are obviously undoubtedly common themes. I mean, it's all, we like to laugh at ourselves. We like, because life is bizarre, isn't it? Yeah, and the more you can la laugh at life, generally that's yeah, good. Yeah, 100%. And certain things you get, like there's slapstick comedy and visual comedy, especially yeah. out of Korea, was fantastic, those sort of guys and things like that. Yeah. But most of the co comics, you're laughing at yourself. Yeah, I, I 100% self-deprecation. I'm a self-deprecating comic. Like, 100, I discovered that because when I started, I used to do material about observational humor. Like, oh, you guys see that new commercial or you guys see this. As soon as I started talking about my, my family and my relationship with my mom and all that, it just changed for me. I was like, yeah. like I started noticing the lot. I was like, okay, there's something here. So it was all, it, it wasn't that wasn't funny. I wasn't saying the right thing at the time. You know what I'm saying? Because being a student of comedy you obviously learn after bomb like the first performance with the with the axis of evil and I, I thought i was gonna get the part you know what i mean i bombed in front of the americans and i bombed in front of the egyptian audience who are educated like me who understand english who maybe have grown up abroad and i was like uh oh you know this is not uh and then at that point it was a decision never do this again or never get down from stage until you get a, a laugh you know and I'm grateful until this day, you know, still no one laughs at my shit, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, I'm just like, <laughs> I've, con I've conquered it a little bit, you know, so. Yeah, so but yeah. you mentioned you, you've gone from that, and being an entrepreneur as well, and you had all your marketing experience. You're now yeah. teaching people, a uh, corporate side. You're teaching yeah, people. Give, give me some tips. And what, what, when you get engaged to deal with public speaking, a lot about confidence. So how, how would you pro approach a corporate? I what do you tell me? I, I'm, I, my, 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 uh, my corporate thing, and if you want to hire me, by the way. No, uh, everyone wants to hire you. I, I give you best price, price Habibi. Habibi, I give you best price. <laughs> um, well, I, I, basically, I tell them I can't teach you to be funny, 
but I can teach you what the stage has taught me. You know what I mean? I can teach you my experience on stage because it's all psychology. Stand up, if you break it down, it's all psychology. How are you going to basically break this person? You know, how are you going to, how are you going to break them with, with your sense of humor, you know? And these essentially come down to techniques, whether it's writing a joke for a presentation. Like I, I coach entrepreneurs on how to pitch to investors because they have a two minute pitch okay. and, and you can't go up to, and most entrepreneurs are fucking frightened of speaking. You know, not everybody has the know-how on how to speak and stuff like that. And now they're put in front of investors and they have to put all they have, you know, in order to make this investor budge on their idea. The idea can be great, but if they, number one thing what investors look for is team, right? If they see that you're not competent enough to deliver what you said you are, they're going to X you out, right? Yeah. So they have that fear of having a bad pitch. So they would bring me in. Right. Because uh, right after my mom passed, I went and I worked with this accelerator and I was coach. I was their marketing guy and I was doing a lot of these different things for them. Right. And uh, and uh, one of the things I was interviewing the entrepreneurs one on one, just like this and just asking them very deep questions. And that was actually the foundation for my podcast. Okay. <laughs> and started, yeah. And I started doing a podcast where I would interview more entrepreneurs, more. Well, what life- was one of the deep questions? Give us one of the deep questions. The deep question. Uh, for, Go on then, I'm um, ready. Well, wait for for the public speaking or the yeah, podcast because there's both, a difference. Both. Well, well, podcast more mainly is more about life. So I would say like what what defines your happiness, for example. And that's a very deep question for people to answer because um, not many people, like I said, are in tune with being happy. You know, some people. Well, what what ex- defines? Okay, what what defines your happiness? What defines my happiness? Yeah, you asked the question. Happy. I'm laughing every single day. It's, I think it's a blessing. If, if you could laugh every single day, I think that's a, I think that's, that defines happiness. And I guess is expressing my love for the people because after my mom passed, I realized that you don't really have a lot of time on this earth, you know, that you can go at any time. And if you don't express that love um, when you need to, to the right people, then it's really, it, it really takes a toll on me. So ha- having that happiness, sharing that happiness, sharing is caring. And, 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 and I, think, I think you're positive. right. The one great thing about this, nothing unites people more than a common enemy. And if the yeah. virus is the common enemy, what have you, you value? The things that we took for granted, like yeah, 100%. Adults, or, or telling somebody that you love them or that sort of stuff. Yeah, 100%. So empowering now to say, do it today. Yeah, and, tomorrow and they ha- will not be here. Well, yeah. And, and, and happiness, again, is doing what you love. Obviously, it's getting interviewed by Mr. Andrew Earborn. Come on, buddy. Enjoy. You've thing. arrived. I love it after so many years. It's always a thrill. It's got to be good. But, but, but you're right. I mean, that, that is the ultimate happiness. I, I totally get that. I, I understand that this is the pinnacle of your career. Forget Comedy Central. You would have given two yeah. livers for this. It's well worth it. Yeah. It's be good. I mean, it, it, it's, very, it's very strange that it came at a very defining moment in my life. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that happened at a very... And it defined ultimately who I am. You know, I could have went the complete opposite way. I'm like, why did she die? Why did it die? Why did I give my liver? What do I? You know, like, I could have went down that path. But I, I thank God that I didn't because... I get to laugh at it instead. And people, a lot of people tell me that I don't grief. And I'm like, no, because I laughed at it because it's funny. And life is a comedy. It's not a drama. But, I, I think, but says, you also know? get, and a lot of comics that I know and, and very famous ones in the public eye, they're, they're great showmen on the outside, but inside they're really tortured and twisted and, and, and a lot of mental illness and things like that. We have Tony Hancock. We had, I mean, there's Pat Milligan. You have all sorts of the great comedians who've yeah. spoken about these challenges. How, how do you deal with it yourself? Um, do um, you want the like the honest answer? <laughs> yeah, we'll do, we'll do um, both. Do the funny answer and then the honest answer, and they collide. That's fine. I don't see. Uh, I guess it's different for me um, personally. I, I find solace in prayer. I, I pray as a Muslim. I pray my my. I try to pray to be a, a good Muslim. So I pray. Part of being a Muslim is praying five times a day, and I think that's something that brings me solace because at that time I was uh, I was uh, you know I, I had nothing except to to go to just my refuge was to go to God because that was that's my upbringing. And I'm very proud of it. I'm not. Upset. I'm not embarrassed of it, you know what I'm saying? Because I do believe. And at the same time, the funny side of it is uh, a lot of drugs. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> no. um, yeah, I, uh, and, and, and I guess that's what gives me, maybe a lot of people don't have that. There, a lot of people have different opinions on that. And that's fine. Everybody is, um, 
to each their own. I'm not going to enforce my religion or my belief system on something like that. In, in my religion, in Islam, it says, you know, don't enforce, you know what I'm saying? You don't have to enforce. You can believe what you believe and you, you believe whatever you want to believe. I'm never going to enforce it on you. You know what I mean? And that's, the, and that's what I, I genuinely believe. And that's at that time, a lot of people have definitely mental illness. And I did. I was in a very dark place. I do remember waking up very sad every single day. You know what I mean? And seeing my mom every single day because you're faced with like, like at that time, if I recall, like I'm faced with like, Hey, your, your mom's dying and looking her in the eye and be like, Hey, I can't help you anymore. The first time when I got dismissed as a donor, you know what I mean? And I had to wait a year and a half to, to become a donor again. I'm just like, Hey, I can't, I can't help you. I'm sorry. I can't help you. I've done what I can, you know? And at that's, at that point it's the one I, I, you know, I would seek refuge in, in prayer. And, uh, that's what I guess got me through everything. And I guess the, the, the professional side is I still, do, I still want to do this. I, I'm not going to put this to the side. I, maybe I'm going to decrease my effort, but I'm not going to stop because I obviously, if some Libyan guy is telling me that he's interested, maybe then I'm on the right track. And if he started, uh, if he was able to start uh, a rival company, then, and I'm on the right track. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm not going to, I don't need an investor. I'm going to continue. You know, I don't, fuck that. I'm just going to continue doing what I do because that's what makes me happy. And I don't care um, how long it's going to take. And they say an overnight success takes 10 years. No, no, I, I, absolutely. And, and it is, it's, it's a, a question. And you always try and wonder how people make it. And I say, when, when we did that international comedy in Montreux and, uh, uh, and I, I was there for a, a few years as, as the chair, it was great <laughs> seeing people around the world. And yeah. it's great seeing the interaction with the comics because yeah. it's like a, a lot of the different people in the entertainment business, they're, they, they're normally at each other and there's a bit of rivalry. Comics are brilliant together. Because you see comics. You laugh about the cheese, you laugh about this. You, and yeah. that's what you want, isn't it? It's a great camaraderie. And, and that's what I really noticed on, on, on that, wherever you came from in the world. So there was that unifying thing. The other thing which is interesting, and, and again, um, coming from Egypt, is about taboo subjects. Are, are there things that you won't touch on in your comedy? Yeah. Uh, uh, look, it depends on the venue, honestly. <laughs> like, I, I remember one of my last shows, one of the last shows before we did, I had a heckler and I fucking called her out and I called her a cunt and I was like, but, but not like directly, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, everybody in this area who's not a cunt, make some noise. And they started clapping, but because she was literally being very, very rude, very, very ill-mannered. And it reached in a point where the staff of the venue, they're like, you're fucking up the show for everyone. They took her and kicked her out. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. Because, because we're, like they know what we do. We we we've been gigging there since October. Yeah, and, and they know what value we bring to their venue. You know what I mean? So they and the thing is with comedy, I noticed that over the past ten years, the doors it opens, man. Like oh my god, like when pe- when people go and see you on stage and they're performing, other people are laughing. They yeah. you have the most respect that that you can ever get. And doors just open, like literally and physically. Like I've performed literally in places that I've never thought I would enter as as some because I don't. I'm not the type of person to go clubbing, for example, or yeah. go to this venue and have a drink. Or I'm not. I'm an introvert, you know. At the end of the day, or I'm an ambivert for for people like, how are you a comic if you're an introvert? Uh, I'm an ambivert, right? Yeah. But <clears throat> it, it opened so many doors, and I noticed like you get that respect automatically from the staff, you know, like, like, yo, and they know you by name and they, they treat you like, oh shit. You know, they, you have that, that newfound respect because I never was confident growing up. I was always the shy, unconfident kid that never had any um, ability to talk to people. I was very shy, you know what I mean? And comedy changed my life, you know? And, uh, well, and, and, that, and, and that's there me. is there is a there is a common pattern I, I find with a lot of the performers that I speak to about how they got there. They normally come from a dark place, or they're the kid that's yeah. been bullied, or they're they're the kids that's. I was bullied. Up. Yeah, I was bullied, hundred percent. I was I was fit perfectly into lockers in high school. I was a little. I hit pub. One of my bits is that uh, uh, what's it called? I say. Uh, you guys notice I have a lot of energy because I'm very enigmatic on stage. You know, I'm very yeah. very hyperactive. I'm very hype. People would say I'm more of a hype man than a comic. I'm like, no, I'm just, I know how to give out the energy and distribute yeah. it, right? So, uh, like, I do this whole ritual in my own shows. Every single show, I'm like, I go on stage and people think I'm going to start the show, right? Because we play the, the music. It's like a 12-second theme. Right. And then, uh, and, then 
and then people are not really so I get on stage and they start to be quiet the hall starts to get the room starts to get a little bit quiet I'm like hey guys what's up uh, and I'm doing it I'm like um, telling them so uh, I asked them some questions I'm like okay so who here who's who's first time to come to a Hezbollah comedy night and they raise their hands I'm like, all right marketing is working out all right cool and then uh, who who's who here didn't never attended a stand-up comedy show and I'm and then they would and I'm like okay so I'm gonna come up here and then embarrass myself like I'm doing now and then I would, that would get a laugh and then I'm like okay for those who haven't attended before we the music that you guys just heard I like to raise the energy in any of the shows and this is where the people call me more of a hype man and it's yeah. the biggest opening ever so I'm like okay so listen this is what we're gonna do you there's a big part that you guys have to do talking to the audience like this like this is this is very crucial to the success of this show. So you guys ready? This is all on you guys, right? And uh, I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna go and I'm gonna play the music. This is the first step, play the music. I'm gonna go hide and announce myself. I'm gonna introduce myself, all right? And then when I come out, okay, this is the important part that's on you guys. You're gonna pretend that this never happened. <laughs> and this is the first time that you're seeing me and it's gonna be great. And then you're gonna really make some noise and and put all that energy out there and I'm gonna feel amazing and it's gonna raise my confidence because I grew up with no confidence, I'm very, very shy. <laughs> and so they start laughing, I'm like, remember guys, the key here, make sure that this didn't happen. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And then I go literally, I hide behind my, my banner. <laughs> it's like an 80, 80 centimeters wide. So it's like literally this wide and I'm hiding behind it like this. They can still see me. <laughs> and then they cue the music. <laughs> and then I'm like, uh, whatever venue, I'm like, yo, new Cairo, make some noise for your host. Put your hands together for your host, Mr. Hashem El Tahi. I come out literally, I'm like hiding right here. I come out like this and they're like, they start clapping. It's all this energy in the room. I'm like, are you not entertained? And it's just this amazing thing. And I'm like, ah, ah. And then they're, everybody's excited. And then uh, I'm like, huh? And then I wink again. I'm like, ah, it worked, huh? And then everybody's just like shocked. Like, who the fuck is this guy? You know? And that's how I start all my shows. And no, it's, it's brilliant. And, and it's, you are your own warm-up, man. I, I think that... 100%. Yeah. And, and I go... Oh, I, high, but they, they give you the possible thing. You say, thank you very much. Good night. And then you leave yeah. the stage. It's got to be good. So work <laughs> on that, yeah. that sort of basis. Well, yeah. I mean, you've got to bring the different... I mean, it's my show. I can produce it yeah. however the fuck I want. You know of what I mean? Of course, absolutely. No, one, no one's going to tell me, oh, don't do that. Fuck you, buddy. It's my show. You know what I mean? I'll do it however the fuck I... I so there are no it. real taboo subjects. I mean, pe people, uh, that, that, that they'll because they're going to a comedy club, they're open-minded mm -hmm. about all sorts of things. And I, I, I guess there are di different things. I mean, television is is obviously, uh, you get rules and regulations as to what you can yeah. and can't do. do you, uh, you're getting more and more TV now? Uh, right now, no. From But be beforehand, you, you were, apart from the live shows, you obviously did your comedy sessions and things. That was 2017. I haven't had any TV things not, recently. Not yet, but tonight, tonight, they're all going to be watching this. They're going to say, we want this guy. He's going to do a Zoom yeah. thing for us. <laughs> I, I did. I, 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 I would love to because I'm trying to set up my whole thing is that, hey, if you want to, excuse me, if you want to laugh, escape for an hour, pay me, uh, pay me $50, my friend. I give you best price. You know what I mean? And, uh, and basically, yeah, and uh, it's one-on-one -on -one with a comic and people would argue like, why am I paying fifty dollars? Because it's one on one of my fucking time. That's why. Of course, <laughs> you know, exactly. so, you know what I mean. They, so they, they they love all that sort of stuff, and it is finding the new way of doing things. Because I say that the frustration of you're not getting that live audience, the buzz anymore. Yeah. People are working out the new way of communicating. But but you have got so many different talents. I mean, apart from the live comedy, you're doing as you say that the public speaking side. So yeah, you you are also about happiness. So that's that's yeah. career development. Well, well, yeah, you said you wanted the tip on on yeah. public speaking. I would say I would say. Um, do something that really breaks uh, breaks the ice. Uh, I've had some people call me, uh, when I because I make calls all the time. Obviously, my phone is my lifeline, right? So yeah. I was I was pitching because this whole thing I'm trying to leverage. It's all about building leverage and how to for the past ten years. Like my dad still tells me, "What the fuck are you doing?" I'm like, "Leverage. I'm leveraging what I've done." You know? He's like, "How is this?" And I'm like, "Well, up until <laughs> up until this COVID thing, I was leveraging the tour that I just did." to go somewhere else, you know, yeah. to, to go to another. So I guess the thing with public speaking, what I can well, give you a tip is that you want to break the ice. You want to leverage whoever's in the room. So when you go into a room, I mean, or a digital meeting, just make sure to break the ice with any, any, any way. Talk about the awkward situation, just little thing. Or if you have a drink, you want to 
take a sip, one sip, make sure it's about this much. So, yeah. And then you clear your throat. You have to clear the. Ah, ah, ah. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm like, <clears throat> so, and then you just start like that, you know. No, there I you go. Do that. Yeah. Or you can comment on the fact how that was really that you had to do that to get their attention. And yeah, exactly. This is, you know? I don't normally do this, but Hashem told me all the way from Egypt. This is one of his tips <laughs> exactly. for how to engage with the way. Yeah. Now we're there. <laughs> That's it. Because like I said, there's people that sit like this well, in their Yeah, absolutely. Oh my God. I, I would tell those people, I remember there was, uh, because with, with the, like the, the older Egyptian audience who don't know stand-up, they refer to it as monologue. Monologue is the, yeah. is the, ancient form in, 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 in like, according to, not ancient, but like what they grew up to, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't stand up, but it was, it was monologue. They would go out and have their monologue and they would have jokes in there, but there'd be no interaction with the audience and that's the difference. So they would relate it to that, right? So I had a really older gentleman, like 60s, maybe 70s. Oh, right? really, old, really old, really yeah, old. Yeah, and he was in the show. And then uh, he, he, he I, everyone's laughing at my bit, right? And then I see he's not laughing, and that throws me off a little bit, you know. And, and I'm like, I'm like, uh, I'm like, you don't understand me, do you? I speak too fast, right? He's like, I'm like, you're laughing on the inside, and then I just see this smirk. He's like, yep. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I got you. I'm <laughs> on the inside. Well, tell your yeah. face, tell yeah, your face exactly. that you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's a good. <laughs> tell your face that you're happy. <laughs> Relate the situation, <laughs> please. Yeah, and and that's basically it. And now it's just like, uh, how do you take all that and transform it and kind of innovate, you know, and uh, see how you can make money in this day yeah. and age because it's really difficult. No, but, but as I said, the, the great thing I is you are adapting. So to this new everybody, what, what the politicians had to do around the world, it's mm. all about communication. And the 100%. trouble with, when you look at the world, as I said, I've been dancing from Australia to Zambia to all the places in between. Yeah. And what happens is the people who are really good at communicating are those who the people get behind them. So you suddenly find, I don't know if you saw in New Zealand, they, the, the prime minister there who was brilliant because halfway through a news conference, there was an earthquake and she just laughed it off and then carried on. And the public just loved her. But you get all yeah. the politicians here spluttering, they can't answer the questions, they're yeah. not really clear on their messages. That's where it boils down, doesn't it? Jacinda. She, I'm a big fan of Jacinda. She's, she's, a, she's, a, she's, very, she's very good at her job. She's very, when you look at her, you're like, okay, no, she knows her shit. You know what I mean? Like, she, and I appreciate that, honestly. And I, I guess in a day and age where communication is the most essential and there's a lot of so much information that you can get on a daily basis, you know what I mean? Um, I, I, the right communication, I guess, is what makes you uh, comfortable at the end. What you, want, what you want to hear, people can shut out a lot. Like I choose to shut out the, you know, of course. So, so you're right. It's sort of basic thing of course, communication. You, you you can be your own filter because if you're not your own filter, you're going to get so many negative thoughts and everything on that. Yeah, hundred percent. And 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 that's what happened with a lot of people. It shook a lot of people the communication that they were receiving. My father included. You know. You know. Um. And at the same time, you're you know, you choose who you want to tune into. You know what I mean? But but I uh, what's it called? I uh, I have uh, I was. I was thinking about like uh, writing this song in Arabic um, because there's obviously beggars here in the streets, you know. So I realized that everybody, all the advertisements that are coming on your Facebook feed and stuff like that, everybody became like this digital beggar. Oh, please watch me. Please watch me. You know what I mean? And then they're advertising their shit. And I don't want to come. I never want to come off. I don't like that, uh, that narrative. I don't want to come off as I'm begging you to watch my shit. I don't, I want to like, you know what I'm saying? I want you to like me for who I am because I got nothing to hide. I'm not going to fucking bullshit you. You know what I mean? I'm at the end of the day, I don't care because I look at it this way, honestly. And this is my perspective in life after my mom passed away, because after you lose a parent from my perspective, this is my own experience. Everybody's different. You tend to give less fucks about being upset in life, you know? And that's a very beautiful narrative, honestly. Like, yeah. if it, it took me losing my mom to, to reach that, but uh, because I'm very, un, until now, me, I have like, oh, what are people gonna think? Because that's very big in, in, in Middle Eastern culture. What are people gonna think? Oh, that's taboo. You can't do this. Oh, you can't date someone that's older. You, you can't date, uh, you can't marry uh, a divorcee, for example. You know what I mean? Like, th there's all these taboos. What are, you, what are people gonna think? And Hassan Minhaj talked about this in his special. 
homecoming king. And he, he said that, that in Indian culture, what are people, his dad was telling him, what are people going to think? And I'm from the narrative of like, well, fuck people, you know, I don't give a fuck. I, why, why do people's opinions affect my happiness? Because I'm living amongst the society. Fuck society. Um, I want that society should not define my own happiness. If I choose to go outside the paradigm, you know, and that makes me happy with just me, without me hurting anybody or offending anybody or doing that, that's fine. And if people get offended of my life choices, at the end, it's my life choices. So who the fuck are you to tell me how to live my own life? You know what I mean? And respectfully, at the same time, I'm not going to be like, hey, no, you fuck you for not believing in my opinion. But that's what comedy is. Comedy is subjective. I have a lot of people that don't enjoy my brand of comedy. You know what I mean? Although I'm the funniest fucking person in the world. That's fine. Not everybody's going to, I'm not everybody's cup of tea. And, and, and I teach that in the, in the public speaking. It's like, um, not everybody's, uh, what's it called? Uh, not, uh, you can't please everybody basically. And, you know that, and, and, and it's a fool's game. You're right. Yeah. It's a fool's game to try to please everybody. You're, you're right in the, in the same way as that guy sitting in the front row is going to hate whatever you do. Yeah. It's 100%. fine. Move on. Yeah. Louis C.K. said it. Louis, Louis C.K. said it. He's like in Madison Square Garden where people are, uh, there to enjoy this comic. There's 1500 people that bought tickets yeah. just to just be, you know, asses, to just be, uh, just to be, sit there and be like this, you know? Yeah. And those are, th there are those types of people. I've had people like, front row sitting like that. And that could be translated online because there are going to be those people and not everybody's alike. Not everybody re resonates that same energy and that's fine. As long as uh, Kevin Hart, he said, he's like, as long as you don't break my force field, if you're adding to it, then great. Then welcome aboard. But if you're going to make me feel like, you're taking from it and taking my energy. No, no, no. Thank you. Door is that way. Assalamu alaikum, buddy. You know what I mean? Like, I don't need to deal with this. And, and it, like I said, losing my mother taught me that. Losing my mother taught me that I should give less fucks about what people say. I don't give a fuck. It, it makes you reevaluate uh, what 100%. is important. You know? 100, oh, 100%. If that shifts in yourself, then you turn around and say, okay, you're comfortable because you, you found the secret of happiness. And the secret of happiness is really not being dependent on yeah. other people's opinions. If, if opinions, you like. if 100%. You're not dependent as you talk about the likes on social media or yeah. early things until somebody writes you a little message or whatever. Yeah. You go yourself, you say what you think, and you get out there, yeah. and you try to make it possible that people can enjoy the journey with you. I mean, uh, it depends again. Like, I'm still trying to grow my, my online army, my little Hashemites, as I like to call them. And oh part God. of it... <laughs> because... <laughs> little Hashemites. How many of those you've got now? How many Hashemites are there? 93, of Hashemites. None, 93 on, on YouTube. 93. You've, got to have a, you've got to have 100 Hashemites. Look, tell you what, I'm going to bring you on here. When you reach your 93, when you reach 100 Hashemites, we're going to have a big celebration. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> that's a, that's a great idea. 100 Hashemites, we're going to work <laughs> the through the door. I, I, I have this thing where I, I call it the Hashemization process. So congratulations, you've been Hashemized. Yes. Don't worry. It's it's not sexual. It's not, it's not a sexual a favor. <laughs> you didn't sign, you didn't sign up for the sexual favor. I know, no. terrible. <laughs> I've been hashemized. Oh, no. So so I'm I'm trying to plan I'm pro planning to just hashemize the world and just spread that same message of happiness and doing whatever makes you happy and not to give a fuck. Honestly, that's my message. And, and, uh, and you're you're a brilliant brilliant advocate for all of that. It's it's been I tell you what, it's been so thank good you, catching up. I appreciate up. that. Thank you. It'd be so good catching up. We're yeah, gonna thank you do so this much. more often. We should t let me know what happens and, and what like, what have you been told in Egypt at the moment? What are the next stages? Because they're starting to ease things off. Is well, yeah, the, the the country just opened up right now. Like now, it's it's like I said. Now the curfew is at eight instead of five. It was yeah, at you nine. Got gigs, are you? I mean, you haven't got gigs yet. Not yet, no. But uh, like I said, I'm doing the whole corporate Zoom thing. So if uh, <laughs> if you want, uh, I give you best price, Habibi. I, I just did it for a client in Dubai. I love it. It's gonna be yeah, cool. I have to. Man. I, you got to eat, and I got to prove to my dad that you, you've got to do it. Here. You've got to get out there and tell people. But I love the stuff you're doing. Your corporate stuff. You've got the other bits and pieces. A lot of people on television are now watching yeah. these sort of things. This is the new yeah. way of production for the, for the immediate future. My, 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 Mina, my, my, uh, my, one of my team members, the one that got the TV show that I told you about in Ramadan, his show that he was on actually is a TV show that is done exclusively on Zoom. Like the right. host was in her place and he was in his place and he was filming the sketches yeah. and he had his own director and so he, he has his own team 
that's film putting out the content they asked him for like 20 videos he's like i'm gonna do 15 because this is crazy because yeah. ramadan is every single day you know you can't just have a, a an episode you miss a day and stuff like that so he did and it's his first time so he's like and he doesn't have a big production he's the one that's doing everything right so he would film and then he would send them the episode and then they would have like a banter back and forth and they're like okay cool let's see today's video and it was done completely on zoom you know what i mean like the whole show which was fascinating and again the paradigm is changing so you have to adjust you have to adapt and i'm still like nowhere near there by the way i'm just scratching the surface i'm just trying to get out of that laziness and that depression of oh where did all the gigs go to try to focus on that and that's very difficult to change that mindset because like i told you my 2020 started off amazing <laughs> and then yes, just like no, I know. yeah, yeah it, like sold out shows six out of seven sold out shows in cairo then sold out tour and we were the best selling show in the in the festival right we were the best selling like people didn't know about the festival but our marketing notified them that there's a festival that there's egyptians in the house you know what i mean yeah. and that was that was an ultimate high i'm up here and then at one point it's just like hit a wall and that's just that's it you know so main 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 moral of the story don't give too many fucks in life because it's not upset it's not worth it to be upset you just got to live and enjoy every moment and that's it that's my message thank you for having me it is a brilliant message i, I think we're all going to turn into hschemites <laughs> in yeah, i hope so i hope so subscribe to my youtube channel so i can make some money. i gotta eat i gotta eat i gotta eat man i gotta eat i gotta prove to dad that i'm not a failure <laughs> <laughs> all this he tells me is like you still haven't done anything i'm like who do you know like goes and does this like who, who like your kids do your friends kids have tv shows where on their tv where they flown out to dubai where they flown out to switzerland where they you know like i tell them this but that mentality of being a father an egyptian father or a middle eastern Arab father is that i have to make sure that my my son is secure you know and that for him translates into a regular nine to five where that stability is there you know that's the, that's stability in his mind not what i think so again with all due respect to everybody just do your thing just do your thing do whatever makes you fulfilled and happy yeah. you know and I, i appreciate what you're doing because you're doing what makes you happy i know octopus tv is is your passion project and you've been doing it for quite some time so yeah. i appreciate you doing it and i'm proud of you and thank you so much for for this i appreciate it I, I, I love it. It's so good to catch up. We'll stay in yeah. touch, see what happens yeah, after. Sure. And we're all Hashemites, we're all going to sort it out. Yes, yes. Take care, uh, send our can love I, can to I, Egypt. Can I, I will, for sure. Um, is there, do you mind if I take some of this and upload it on my YouTube channel? No, I'll send you, I'll send you all of it. <laughs> you, perfect. You send perfect. it to the world. It's all going to be there. Yes. I'll send it to you straight after this. It's perfect. Because cool. I did the interruption. There's lots of other great ones as well, because we're talking to everybody around the world, but not just people in there. I'm talking to the, the, the rich and famous. We've got lots of musicians. We've got lots of comedians, but we also got lots of politicians and various other people as well. Every walk of life. So the head of BAFTA, <laughs> In LA, we had uh, Harvey Goldsmith, a fantastic promoter over here. Uh, um, great people from every walk of life. And I even had a few Hashemites as well. So it's all wow. good stuff. It's oh, all good stuff. stuff. No, thank you, man. I appreciate it. It's an honor. Um, is there, is there, there any way you, uh, what's it called? Because I know that you're very well connected to a lot of different people. Um, is there any way that I could do like a, uh, one of these with like someone famous? Just throw a name. Oh, yeah. No, I'll tell you what, we'll, do, we'll try and get you together with some people. And what we'll do, you can do a shout out. I'll tell you what, you should do a shout out. This is your shout out because they're all going to be watching this. They're going to turn around and they're going to say, who would you like to do one with? God, I'm going to, I'm going to, it's a full screen. This is your close up, Mr. DeMille. You're going to do your appeal now for the, for the mm -hmm. comedians you want to work with. Here we go. This is it. Go for it. Right now? Yeah. Okay. I want the big ones are Russell Peters, Eddie Izzard. Um, Eddie Izzard, sorry if I mispronounced it. So I apologize, mate. I apologize. Uh, okay, Dave Chappelle, definitely. Uh, maybe some bigger celebrities, some rock stars. If you want to talk to an Egyptian, we're from the pyramids. What up? <laughs> you know. So um, I'm actually inside my uh, my pyramid, my dad's pyramid. <laughs> But no, I would definitely like to to talk with some comedians. Uh, let's you know, let's let's do this. Let's use the the technology. Make the technology, Habibi, uh, connecting everybody here. I give you best price when you talk. I need your dollars <laughs> and your euros, mate. Your fucking euros, yeah? So yeah, so um, if anybody wants to collaborate and talk with another comedian from the Egyptian sand, please, please, I, am, I, mean, I give you best price, Habibi, Allah. <laughs> yeah, so if you, if you have anybody, Andrew, that uh, you can refer to, 
shout me out. I'll do it. I'd love to It'll do it. It'll be one of you. You've done the best shout out yourself. I think that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank we'll you. We'll continue the conversation. It is super. It's lovely to see you again. Thank you so lovely. much for joining me. Thank you, Habibi. Wallahi, you are Habibi, my friend. You are Habibi. Look, my heart is beating. For you. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Take Look care. after yourself. Take care. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 There you go, all the way to Egypt with Hashem. A fantastic guy. It's so good to catch up with him. As I say, last time I saw him was in the Montreux Comedy Festival when I had the great honor for a couple of years of being the chair and seeing comedy around the world. Uh, as Madonna said in her bath, this is the great unifier. Uh, what I've loved about this show is seeing people from around the world and how this is bringing them together. Uh, we are all basically the same un underneath everything, and it doesn't matter where you come from. Uh, the more we can talk about things, the better. If you'd like to collaborate with Hashim, become another Hashemite, uh, I'm sure he'd be loved to be in touch. Write to me at lol, that's L-O-L, at oxfordstv.com. Don't forget to subscribe. Um, and if you want to be on the show, let me know. Put the comments below. But for now, thank you very much to Hashim all the way over in Egypt. I look forward to seeing you next time for more exciting guests from around the world in Andrew Eborn's Lives on Lockdown. I'll see you next time. Take care.